Hoffler and I am um, presented, presenting here from St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. And I'm sitting here in, in, my, uh, in my workspace slash kitchen slash dining room slash where I hang out all the time these days. So I'm going to present to you today about an expedition we took last summer, which was um, in the mainland portion of our province in Labrador. And this presentation is called The River with Two Names. And uh, we ended up traveling from Shapio Lake to Hopedale. And uh, you'll see a little bit more of that as we, uh, as we get going. Okay. It's saying, that the, oh, let me just hit over here and then maybe it'll let me. Okay. Nice. It doesn't want to um, move forward at the moment, which is always kind of interesting because uh, my, I've always learned about tech, never show it that you're scared uh, or nervous. Uh, but yes, none of my advanced things are moving at the, advancing my slides at the moment. So that's kind of interesting. So I'm going to stop the share for just a second and pop back out. Um, there we go. And just go back in again. Just pop, bear with me, folks, and see how uh, I'm not allowing panic to creep into my voice and see if uh, it will let me go. There we go. See, sometimes you just need to ask it to start again. So I know we've got folks uh, attending from across the country. Um, I always like to start a little bit with a map because I'm a big fan of uh, geography and I love maps. And I often consider my expedition and outdoor life as living the map. So here you can see not quite a perfect um, outline of the outline of Labrador. Um, um, I don't think we can see it there. Okay, you can't see no. the presentation? No. Okay, so that's interesting. Thanks, I popped back out again. Okay, so um, let me try the share again. Cause, uh, so I'm sharing desktop one. So can you see? You can see desktop one and if I go into presentation mode now and if I can't I'll just I can leave it in this mode and we can present from here if the full mode doesn't work so let me try this okay can you see that yeah okay so I guess the, the gremlins are just uh, playing with us this afternoon so, <laughs> testing us oh so yeah if, if we lose contact again please just let me know because I can't actually see anything but uh, but uh, you're it says education webinar host yes yeah, so, yeah so just just give a shout so here again we'll try this uh, so hopefully you're seeing now the labrador outline there and you can see the little yellow dots there uh, on the island of newfoundland and that's where uh, i'm presenting from here in um, st john's um, Labrador has a uh, square footage of nearly 300,000 uh, kilometers and is home to approximately 30,500 folks. So there's tends to be a lot of space to, to go out and exploring. And it is a favorite um, spot for myself and some of my companions to go on more uh, intense kinds of expeditions. So you'll see a square there, hopefully in the middle of the map. And maybe you see kind of a, a long dark line, diagonal line there. And that is a, um, a lake called Harp Lake. And in many ways it resembles a small canyon because of the sides of the uh, landform rise off, uh, off the lake on either side uh, to quite a height. And so that was where we had hoped to begin our expedition. So this is the crew that uh, you'll be going on this expedition with. Um, I'm there in the front just with my ice cream cone and um, sprinkled uh, hair there. And then to right ahead of, atop of my head is Mark Dykeman, and he's a, a engineer. And behind him is Darren McDonald. He is a high school music teacher. And to my right is Marion Wissink. She is a systems administrator. And uh, we like to go out and live the map uh, and in many different places. So oftentimes when I'm getting set to go out on a, a longer kind of an expedition, I like to learn a lot about the place that I'm traveling in and through. So when we first had the idea to try to do this river, one of the first things I noticed as I started to do my research is that the river had uh, two names. 
And that was interesting. I'd never seen that. And oftentimes that we know because of um, the way things get named on maps that many places have traditional indigenous names that were covered up or lost um, through the colonial process. So I always like to, again, to, to look about place names differently. So um, the river that we are looking at is sometimes called the Adlatok and it's sometimes called the Ujaktok. And uh, this river is kind of unique because oftentimes rivers have a, a, a shape of a tree that you start out at a, at a twig level and go onto a branch and then you come into the main river. This particular river actually branches right before the ocean. And it has two oceans about 15 K up from the ocean. And one of those branches is called the Adlatok, which translates roughly as place of the Innu uh, in, a, in Inuktitut. And um, the other branch is called the Ujaktok, which uh, translates roughly as the places where there are seal. And it derives from the Inuit word for uh, Ujuk. And you'll notice there's lots of different spellings depending on, on who is writing those um, Inuit or Inuktitut uh, words into, into English. Uh, this is an area that uh, folks would traditionally travel from the coast to the interior as a way or from the interior out to the coast as a way to to move goods and and furs and things. So um, Jamie Jackman, I can thank for giving me a little bit more of the information about these two um, names. And depending on the age of the map and the particular map you're looking at, you'll see different, the, the two different names. So here you'll see my finger pointing to Harp Lake, which is kind of reminding me of, a, of an eel shaped lake there with its, um, or uh, a spearfish kind of a, uh, of a look. And then above it there in the black circle, you'll see the Adlatok. So on this particular map, the Adlatok is the bigger name of the river and then it would branch out uh, near the ocean into Adlatok Bay and Ujtok Bay. But on another map or in a different report here, you'll see that the, the river actually has the Ujtok as the upper part of the river and then the branches. And uh, on this particular um, report, which you'll see to the right and you won't be able to, to read it, it's not your eyes, it's, it's the scan of this article. We also looked at who might have traveled um, down this river. So Herb Pole is a, is a pretty um, common name that comes up in many canoe routes in Canada. So uh, he had done it. And again, this was another description of routes of folks who might have traversed this particular river system. And in this particular book, it, the, the whole river was called the Ujitok. And at some point, they, things made the transition and became the Adlatok. So um, I, had, I wasn't as familiar with the river that sort of flip-flopped back and forth and, and based on the map. So that was kind of interesting. So that when we were naming our expedition, we said, we won't pick sides. We'll just call it the river with two names. So before you go out on any expedition, uh, whether it's for the long weekend or whether it's for a week or for a month, um, or if it's for three months, it's, it's kind of fun these days. I'm um, reliving through Facebook a 90-day canoe expedition that we did two summers ago that actually just started two years ago uh, yesterday. So that's been kind of fun to refresh our minds on that. When you're doing a canoe route that, uh, or a kayak route that involves portaging, you all want to try to save a lot of weight. So it's not uncommon that uh, we weigh every piece of uh, gear that we're taking with us and having yummy food to uh, eat is uh, pretty ha handy as well so you're looking at sort of three different uh, foods being prepared on the dehydrator one is moose sausage one is uh, dried carrot and the other is salsa all of which rehydrate quite nicely the other thing these days when we travel out in the wilderness, we might want to share that experience as we go, or we may have navigational equipment that requires uh, electricity. And so the water lily company here from St. John's provided us with a, a test water lily, and this uses water current as a way to generate electricity in the field. And we also took a, a solar panel. Once you make your initial cuts on what you might want to take with it, it's important with you. It's important to head out to uh, your your boat shed and make sure it actually all fits in your boat. Especially like in our case that we were going to use a float plane to to head out.
So here we are back again to, uh, to our map and uh, all of the crew started our trip in St. John's and uh, Darren and Mark both drove across the island and then got the ferry across the straits and then drove the Labrador Highway into Happy Valley Goose Bay. Mary and myself uh, had some work commitments so we, we flew to Deer Lake and then on into Goose Bay. And this is uh, the guys getting off the, the ferry in Blanc Sablon. This is us arriving in arrivals. And you always arrive when heading out on an expedition um, a little bit early because you want to make sure you hadn't, didn't have any uh, delays um, and things like that. So it gave us a little bit of time to, to look around and kind of settle into, into Labrador, which uh, compared to our lives here in um, St. John's, the topography is a little bit different. The ground covering is different here. You can see the sand, there's a lot more sand. And we're actually here on the shores of Lake Melville. And uh, both Darren and, and Mark had finished a, a, a different expedition here. So they were remembering arriving on a much hotter day and, and going for a swim here. So this is the Labrador flag, which was, um, created in 1974 and the, and the three colors refer to the snow, the land and the water. And you can visit the Labrador uh, interpretation site um, there in um, Northwest River. And so we were uh, seeing some traditional kayaks. Mark and Darren on this expedition would be paddling kayaks and myself and Marion would be traveling by canoe. So in the same interpretation site, we saw some of the traditional um, Inuit and Inuk uh, kayaks here. And we were gonna finish the expedition at Hopedale. So you're always interested to see where you might be finishing a trip. We also paid a visit to this museum, which is housed in the former Hudson's Bay Company store. So in here, there are um, many pictures as well of historic expeditions. Here in Newfoundland and Labrador, when we think about canoeing and we think about um, early expeditions in Labrador, oftentimes people may have heard about the Hubbards. So um, there was an expeditions in 1903 and 1905. And so in the same museum, you can see ex pictures from those early expeditions and they're tracking up current. So they're going against the current here to make way. And so this is Mina Hubbard and she actually made an expedition in 1905 uh, to further her husband's expedition which was cut short because they took a wrong turn and that's a that's a whole other bit of uh, storytelling I, I may have to do for you another day but Mina Hubbard is one of my early expedition heroes. When you visit the the museum in Northwest River uh, they've built these wonderful models of what life would look like in um, in the turn of the century Northwest River and, and even some today. So this is what it looks like to track and pole the way up a river. So as I said that we had planned to fly into that sort of spearfish looking lake called Harp Lake there. Hopefully you're still seeing that on the left. And then join the, the river with two names, the Adlatok Lujatok, and then paddle out the Adlatok branch. So you'll see the red line there and you'll see where I've got it saying Adlatok River and Ujatok, and that's that, that branch 15K from the sea. Both would end us up in the same spot. We elected uh, to plan for it to go to the Adlatok uh, because it was more time on the river. You'll also see under the big curve, which we're all so much more familiar with curves these days, this is kind of the, the curve that hasn't been flattened. You'll see Shapio Lake there. And Shapio is actually where we ended up starting our trip. So if you would sort of put that formally in your mind. And we, we got dropped off at around, um, there's a little bump there just shy, just south of uh, the S in Shapio. And that's where we ended up being dropped off. So when you go up um, into a big expedition, either for field work or for an expedition, it often times involves flying in a float plane and um, flying uh, in smaller planes usually means you want to be flying with lower wind. So here we are up very early even before the sunrise to see if we can get all of our equipment and our boats into this Twin Otter on floats. Uh, this was actually a fairly easy packing trip because we were only traveling with the one canoe. Uh, did a, uh, For the pilots and myself uh, who sat in, near the front it was a bit of a, a crawl in. Um, 
but it, things went actually fairly smoothly. But when we first got there, the pilots had said, we might not be able to fly in. They weren't sure about the weather. And so we thought we'd be on weather hold some of the day, but then uh, Keith, the head pilot came out rather um, confidently, and, confidently and said, let's go. So here we are heading off, excited to be hopefully getting to our destination. And we flew and had a beautiful day flying, a uh, beautiful morning flying over the, the boreal forest of, of Labrador. You can kind of see the, the sandy condition of the soil there. And then the clouds started to form a little bit here. Here us, here's us flying over Lake Melville. And then the clouds got a little bit thicker. And, and when you're flying in, you get a little bit more and more nervous when you see this because uh, unlike large planes, they need to fly by visual rules, which means if the clouds come in, you might have to turn around and fly back to Goose Bay, which means you could have a very expensive flight seeing experience. When we first started to get closer to Harp Lake, we, we thought, oh, maybe it was clearing. So our spirits rose. And then when we actually got a little bit of a look here, you can see at the, uh, the intense uh, cliff side of Harp Lake here, we thought maybe we could get in. This lake is only about a 1.5 kilometers across. It's 30 kilometers long. Um, the head pilot flew along it, um, trying to see if he could get in safely. And as it turns out, he couldn't. So they made the turn back towards Goose Bay and we thought, oh no, we're not gonna get into our expedition. They motioned for me to come up to the front and, and asked me if we wanted to go to another river called the Kinnear Iktok. This river is one that myself and Marion had paddled in 2013. Very beautiful river, but we had no maps. Uh, we weren't prepared for that. So we said, no, well, let's not do that. So Keith being a very sharp on the spot thinker said uh, to himself, I know of this landing beach on Shapio. So I'll put the plane down here so we can have a face-to-face -face conversation. And as we landed uh, on this body of water, we realized where we were. And I re remembered from research that it did connect into the river system that we wanted. So we said, we didn't plan to be here, but yes, you can leave us here, we'll figure it out. And so uh, one big take home lesson from this particular thing is when traveling into remote places by flow plane, um, have a plan B, C and D, and ideally bring maps for um, plans A, B and C or D. So it's always an interesting moment when you get dropped off in a more remote location and you see your uh, float plane or your helicopter take off and leave us. So as I said, I'm a big map fan. So here you'll see um, Harp Lake there over to your left with the green line and you'll see our actual start with the red line. So you can see we, um, with our new drop off location, we didn't have nearly as far to paddle. So we decided first off to actually paddle upstream before heading downstream once again. So first thing that you do, you usually have been up quite early to, to fly out, so we made camp. And after we made camp, you'll see a big bluff up to your right. And we said, let's go get a sense of, of where we've been dropped off because you, um, it's wonderful to immerse yourself in the wildness, get to know the new vegetation that you've been placed in, get a sense of how bad the bugs are and have a lovely walk to, to stretch out. So we climbed to the top of that bluff here. So uh, an amazing view from up here. And if I could draw your attention to the patterns in the sand, I actually thought this looked quite like a Zen garden um, that had been intentionally raked by um, someone. But in fact, that was made by the patterns of the wind and the snow and the melt. From that view up there, you can see Darren's got his uh, head net on. So we were starting to immerse ourselves as well in the bug, the bug land. You can see down to your left there on the diagonal line with the, with the trees, you can see a little bit of our camp. You can see the river um, that comes uh, into Shapio Lake. And so we decided that hey, let's paddle up to our right for the day, the next day once we had settled in. So we returned back down to camp and the light began, began to be quite beautiful. And um, you'll see there at the bottom of your screen, we travel with a device called the Garmin InReach. And this enables us to send out a text message by satellite each day with a map location of where we're located so people can keep track of us. And this is often now used in remote field work as a way for workers who are working in remote settings and also for adventurers and uh, 
folks to share their their location as well as their thoughts. So every day there, as we go through this, you'll see how I summed up our day in 140 characters or less. So we were initially quite sad not to be at Harp Lake. So I, I described ourselves as heart, harp broken, but we did adjust to our, our new plan because there really wasn't anything else to do but adjust, kind of like uh, adjusting here in, in COVID times. Mark is often the chef on our first nights. So uh, he cooked uh, some potatoes, some steak, and even provided a few beverages for us to start. So you'll see these uh, other maps. So these are maps that I use on my phone. We often take a combination of maps, both paper maps as well as digital maps. So these are Canada Topo, and Canada Topo is an app available for both Mac and for Android systems. And I tried this time, something a little bit differently was to record the map with each day and our distances. So it didn't, you won't always see a complete map because um, again, we were in an area that we didn't necessarily anticipate being. Uh, you're looking at topographical maps here. And so on topographical maps, the, the topography is portrayed with those uh, lines, which are called contour lines, which is actually a misnomer. misnomer they're often, um, they're actually more accurately called circles because they join areas of equal elevation where the lines are closer together, the terrain is steeper, and where it's further apart, it is um, less steep. Uh, on the right-hand map on map two, you'll see the things that kind of look like infinity or like squiggles. Those are uh, rapids or waterfalls. So we headed upstream for day one, or sorry, for day two. And we, that mo next morning as we headed out, were rewarded with these most amazing views and stillness. When you're traveling by uh, paddle, either by kayak or canoe, wind is one of the biggest factors in whether or not you can travel, more so in a canoe than in a kayak. So seeing water that looked like this was, was pretty amazing and seeing views and reflections. Uh, we felt very uh, lucky to be where we were. Making our way. So there's Mary and myself in the kayak, Marion's in the bow and I'm in the stern, Darren in the blue kayak and Mark in the yellow kayak here performing a rescue on a dragonfly that was uh, floating, still moving his wings. So Mark scooped up the, the dragonfly and put him on his deck. And uh, after a little while, its wings dried and off it flew. We uh, stopped once we got to the up upstream paddling, had some lunch, uh, refreshed, and then uh, paddle, paddle a little bit in the moving water, knowing it would be a few more days before we were back in moving water and then headed back. As we picked up that afternoon, which is often quite common, the winds picked up and uh, got a little bit exciting on, on the lake. As we came uh, back towards camp here, this is us leaving the, the little exit river, we went over to the right there, you'll see that sandy beach, and then behind there, we found this uh, lovely little creek and paddled up it to see, what, uh, to see what we could find. And you'll notice there's a little bit of a, an orangey color there to the water. That's common in our northern boreal forests uh, because they're paddling or they're flowing through um, coniferous forests, oftentimes they'll pick up the color of tea. Um, so if you are drinking it, it's like you're drinking a pre-brewed uh, cup of tea. So again, settled into camp for the night and just uh, started to feel that deepening connection to the land that we were traveling through. Have a little drink while you read uh, day two summary. Day three um, meant we were going to aim to uh, traverse all of Chapio. And on this topographical map, you can see the French spelling. We thought we'd explore a little lake system at lunch. So you can see there the yellow flag, that's our lunch spot. And you can also see that this is a very long, narrow body of, of water as well, which means we need to keep in mind the influences of wind, which could uh, bring up quite a quite a bit of waves. We were very glad to wake up to another beautiful morning. And 
we set off. Not too long later, a couple hours, we, we made uh, a break on this beautiful beach for lunch. And then noticing that the clouds were starting to build, we said we better, we better get on with it and moved along. And you can see in behind us, some of the topography you wouldn't necessarily want to be caught out in, in with big waves. And of course, then you look over your shoulder and see this big storm coming in. It was like, okay, we better paddle hard and, and get to, to the end of the lake. So we uh, landed here with a little tiny bit of a surf behind ourselves. And we had seen this particular land feature from the satellite pictures before the trip and we couldn't quite make out what it was. And it turns out it was a giant sand dune, a giant flat sand dune, which tells us that this particular lake is windy quite often and has deposited many, many, um, lots and lots of sand over, over the millennials or, or millenniums as it's, uh, as it's formed. And probably the sand dune eventually helped sort of plug up this end of the lake. So we explored a little bit of the ways uh, at some of the breaks into the sand dune and then relaunched a bit. You can see there the bugs have come on as the end of the day is nearing and uh, found this old um, hunting and fishing lodge and so just sort of thought we'd check out what was on the go there and uh, wandered around a bit. And then the next day after we'd made camp, it was time to see if we could actually get out of Shapio Lake and into our river system. If not, it was gonna be uh, an interesting uh, exploration of Shapio Lake and then having to call the, the, float plane the float plane back. So again, here, as you look at our map on the right, you'll see a little blue squiggly sign, which told us that we probably had some waterfalls to uh, portage around in to, in to get into Shapio Lake. And you can see Shapio Lake making that big oxbow move there. So we paddled a little ways, and then we came first uh, to this rocky outcrop, outcrop and this first rapid. Now, we probably could have run this first rapid in the canoes, except when we did our scouting, uh, we discovered there were two very large waterfalls awaiting just around the corner there um, in the distance there to the right. So we elected in the canoe, which isn't quite as maneuverable and as forgiving as a kayak to line our canoe. Well, the, we, we had Mark and Darren line the canoe over down to where we were going to start the portage and you'll see why that was the case in just a bit. So portaging is a, a very figure, a very uh, vigorous physical activity that you get to do on a canoe trip when you need to move around obstacles or so around rapids or around waterfalls or when you want to move between river systems. A lot of times when you want to move over a height of land it would require portaging. So we found this old river bend and did our first run through the riverbed and then we actually found an old uh, portage trail that folks would have used uh, in behind those trees there that are reflected in the water. Um, there is an old trail that we were able to use for trip number two and number three. So this is the reason why we elected to line our canoe and why um, we had to do the portage is these very big waterfalls um, that were probably runnable for an elite kayaker. So Darren is an elite kayaker and he did spot a line, but he would have needed a different boat and a lot of his fellow paddlers with safety gear to make sure they could do it well. I, um, on the other hand, don't have the skill to run that level of waterfall, so was quite happy to portage. So once we got around, we also took some photographs of the water. Of, it was actually two waterfalls from the bottom and here you can see me looking quite sad and maybe doing my best bear imitation. And when you travel in bear terrain, there's a lot of learning to be done about learning uh, bear behavior. So in Labrador, we're worried about two kinds of bears. In the inland country here, we would be worried about black bears. And near the coast, we would be worried about both black bears and polar bears. So we often carry bear spray. <laughs> Um, so I'm a bit sad here because my bear spray let go a little bit there in my um, canoe bag. And so during the portage, I was exposed to 
bear spray, which wasn't the most um, pleasant experience, kind of intense, uh, kind of like rubbing your eyes with a bunch of pepper. And I know that during COVID times, we've all been taught about being aware of touching our face. And I tell you, this was a very intense lesson in how often um, one touches one's face. And uh, so I was having to sort out Bear spray is in an oil, so you actually need soap and water to get it off. And so uh, it took a little while to get everything cleaned up and, and safe again to put things in my purse and to have the intensity of the bear spray experience uh, wear off. And in a hot day with lots of bugs and bear spray on your face, the portage got a little bit too exciting for me. We uh, stopped and had a little bit of lunch and enjoyed the view halfway across the, uh, the portage and then set off again, having uh, gotten through the two waterfalls. And now we're actually on the Shapio River. And it was nice to, to float downstream and get a sense of um, the new surroundings. And it didn't take too long. It was only about 5K until we needed next to Portage. So you'll remember that hunting and fishing lodge that we stopped at. This is would have probably been their um, flat bottom boat that they kept to be able to uh, fish near the falls. They could come over, I think, by ATV. So we, we camped here, uh, and this was the next set of waterfalls that we needed to um, traverse around. And it was a big decision whether we put in between the waterfalls so uh, later that day, we did a little bit of a, a, a scouting. We, we tried our water lily here in the big water to see if it would uh, work here. It definitely was a lot of water running through it, but hard to actually keep it in the current with so much, with so much current. So we had seen this leading off into the distance. So we said probably easiest if we just portage around all four falls. So we knew it would take several trips, so we set out. And I did have a drone on the trip, so this was the guys, they elected to sort of load their kayaks and drag them over the caribou lichen, which is the white uh, coloration you're seeing there. And they thought it would, they would slide much easier than they, they did. So they were in for a very arduous uh, portage. I was carrying the canoe on the first run and, and it was a long portage. It was about two kilometers uh, one way. So it was a long go. So we did stop and and rest uh, several times along the way. So here you can see Mark uh, dragging his, his kayak and I'm carrying the, the kayak. I had my GoPro in my hand. Huge hot day as it often turns out to be. The bugs were absolutely horrendous. So it was one of those character building experiences that we often talk about from being outside. And uh, we were pretty glad to be done with round one. And if you look carefully there at Marion's face, <laughs> you can see that she was um, pretty good fodder for the black flies that day as was as was Darren so we were quite glad to be here in our bug house uh, safely tucked away from from the bugs for dinner and uh, here was my own um, face all bitten up uh, because it was a pretty long go on a pretty hot day and they were out and it was a pretty interesting day to to take the canoes over but as always, usually it seems that when you've had a super hard day on an expedition, then you're rewarded with a view like this as the sunset was going down over the river above the falls with such stillness. So the next day we had to finish the portage and then we were actually on um, the Adlatok, Ujatok River with two names. So we carried and we carried and we carried. This day we woke up to an absolute opposite day. So it was pouring rain and the rain I think took, kept the, the bugs down until we got to the part where we had to traverse down the steep slope back to the river. So rather than carry them down, we thought it was safer to lower them down. So here Mark is going rodeo style with his kayak, lowering it down over the Labrador Tee. Uh, you can see it there, classic, um, Labrador uh, plant. It is used for tea. The, uh, it's, it's quite delicious to steep. It's important that you never boil Labrador tea and it's important that folks um, that might be pregnant uh, never drink Labrador tea um, while pregnant. Uh, here's uh, Darren lo lowering his um, canoe or his kayak down the, down the slope 
and it was a pretty exciting. Um, I found, unfortunately, that these platforms don't stream well, so you won't get to see any uh, boat wrestling videos, which I would have had in if you were seeing this in person. So here we are lowering our own canoe. And pretty exciting to get to the bottom to, uh, we're soaking wet here at this point. We've got the canoes loaded and you can see in the background there behind me, the last fall. So there was a series of force falls uh, coming through to bring the water from Sheffio Lake onto the Adlatok Ujatok. If by chance you'd like to see a little um, video uh, from that experience of taking um, the boats and all of our gear across that portage, if you go to my website, which is talockler.com, there is the link there to seeing um, a little film called OMD, Old Man Dykeman and the School of Drag as uh, he portaged that. We hadn't actually, if our original route had gone through, we would have had no portaging on this troop trip until the last uh, falls before the, the ocean. So it was a bit unexpected to be portaging. When you get really wet and cold while being outdoors, there's only kind of a couple of ways to warm yourself up. One is to change your clothes and try to get dry or put on additional clothes, put on a hat. Um, the other is to eat, uh, fire up your metabolism. So because we were so cold from the portage, we stopped fairly soon afterward and, and fired up the stove there to get some soup and to get some calories in. It's amazing how quickly you can go from feeling quite desperately cold outdoors to, oh yeah, I really actually like this again through um, some hot drinks and uh, through some lunch. So it's a, a good thing to always remember if you're feeling kind of cold and miserable, either do some exercise or put on some additional layers of, of clothing. So you can see Marion here dressed up quite well. You'll see she's also choosing to wear her PFD even though she's on land. And you might say, why is she doing that? And that's just, again, the ultimate layer, we call it the PFD. It's nice and warm. And if you take it off, you've lost a, a layer. So we set off after lunch, excited to finally be on the river. We thought we might be on five days earlier. Then we hit some sandbars and Mark set off dragging his, his kayak again. And then we were able to um, uh, enjoy relative comforts of home here in this trapper's cabin. People often who, who um, work in such remote locations are kind enough to leave access available. So we were able to get warm, get everything dry and, and ha enjoy a lovely evening in the cabin. And then the next day we, we set off knowing we would come to the branch. So there on the right hand side in the day seven, you'll see the branch. So as you can see, we took the left branch. So then we knew we'd gone from the river of one name, or sorry, of two names to the river uh, called the Adlatok, leading to the Adlatok branch. If we had turned right there, we would have gone to the Ujatok. Another sort of gray foreboding day. And we actually had to stop and run a rapid. Uh, so we, um, did some scouting there and jumped into the boat, got all wet again in that rapid. So again, what do you do when you're wet and cold outside? You have a snack, you have some lunch. You can see there our solar panel. So besides the water lily, we use um, a solar panel to uh, power our electronics, our GPS and our satellite phones. Uh, the day got a little bit calmer as we went and uh, comparing some pictures here. And you can see just ahead of time there, ahead of you in that river view, you can see it kind of pinches and you're kind of like, where does the river go? So we were able to um, get almost to the end of our river and we knew that there was another canyon section and we had been told there was a, another portage off to um, our right. So we knew it was time to start looking. Uh, so we're enjoying the, the cliffs in the coast of Labrador, the cliffs, the, the coast tends to be quite cliffy. And so we started uh, making a portage over towards the ocean. We made a big right-hand turn. And uh, even putting our stuff back in the boat here for this tiny pond helped us get around an area that was flooded out. And we had lots of black flies at this camp. This camp, we were, would usually have camped out or cooked outdoors over a fire, but this day we actually cooked with the stove inside the bug shelter because they were incredible. Once we finished the portage the next day, we we're here on entering Adlatok Bay. So we're on the ocean. So the water here now is starting to be salty. 
and we ran around um, again another cold miserable day so here we are in dry suits on the ocean you never know when conditions can change so more conservative paddling attire is in uh, a dry suit so here is the end of the Adlatok, and so Darren had some fun playing in the exit waves of, of the Adlatok River. And we came around the edge, and the, you can see there that the sea is starting to kick up. So we knew it was time to uh, make camp. And we knew this fishing lodge was here. This is Camp Adlatok. And some interesting things about Camp Adlatok is this is a place where some very Famous folks uh, had come to fish. George Bush Sr., President of the United States, as well as Jean Chrétien had fished here. It was locked up tight because it was the end of their season. So we just sort of camped outside the, um, the bunkhouse, got our tents into the lee, and it was pretty chilly. It was only about two degrees here, and we wondered, wow, how cold would we be for the rest of the expedition? Again, because we were ahead of schedule, because our trip had been shortened a bit, we did some exploring here, checking the exit rapids and um, looking upriver, saying, well, maybe we should have done our portage a little bit differently because we could have enjoyed these last little bits of rapid. Um, again, use the windbreak here to set up a lovely little eating situation and camping situation, feeling quite luxurious when we found a few lawn chairs to use and a piece of plywood to actually uh, cook up off the ground in. Spent the next day kind of walking and wandering up river there. You can see some more of that caribou lichen. You can see the black spruce. And this, uh, as a fishing location, there was lots of trails up and down the, the sides of the banks where folks would have gone to, to fish. And then we looked up the, the canyon section here and said, well, maybe indeed we could have used the, the historic portage route, which uh, we found here in this photograph. So at one point, another name for this river was the Paget River, and these folks are sitting um, right below. So if you look back now and see that, um, that little pinch there where the water's coming through, you'll see that it looks quite familiar, a higher water level in this picture. Uh, so interesting always to, to see photographs from what it would have looked like uh, over a hundred years ago. Did a little bit of flying with the drone here over the ends of the river. And uh, Darren thought about actually driving, dragging his kayak right back up uh, and trying to see to run that, that last set of exit rapids. So we were making the transition from the river to the sea. So we were starting to um, think about what we needed to do to be ready to take our canoe and our kayaks out on the ocean. As was the, the case here for our trip when we were starting out on a new phase, the, the wind lay, uh, laid down and we had an absolute stunning beginning. So you can see there on the map, we're making our way out the Adlatok Bay and you can see there the yellow um, flag there and that would be the old village of Adlatok. It was a settler village and you'll see some some photographs of our visit there. So we packed the boats. You'll see we have a skirt here on our, our canoe that's in case the weather changes. This was a, a cabin at the head of Adlatok Bay that we just uh, paid a quick visit to. We saw the sign and said okay let's uh, let's move on and enjoyed an absolute beautiful day paddling on the ocean with our kayaks. This hand, um, this rock wall became our hand rail for the day. And of course, sometimes on expeditions, you only have uh, photographs of when the weather is beautiful, which it was indeed on this day. So lots of photographs today. And here we're approaching uh, the community of Adlatok. And it was uh, a settler community uh, that was here so folks could cut wood. And it was initially settled by the Mitchells. And you'll see this particular, um, uh, you'll see some older buildings as well as some newer buildings. This is actually the mayor of Hopedale and her husband. So they had come out. It's now a cabin settlement for folks out, um, traveling out from Hopedale who'd like to be out on the land and also who might need to cut wood. So we had some lunch and then we went to try to explore what's called the old house. So here is the old house. It was uh, built in the late 1800s, still stands today. And uh, 
amazing um, carpentry to be standing that long. After lunch, we decided to head out. The, the mayor had warned us that there was a three-legged bear that they had seen. So we said, okay, let's keep an eye out. Uh, feeling bad for a, a bear that might have been injured. And uh, we said, as we were heading out, that the wind was starting to pick up. We thought we should perhaps put on our dry suits. Then we actually saw the three-legged bear and said, no, we'll, we'll take our chances with the wind and just leave the bear to, to run through its terrain. We didn't want to stress it at all use these islands kind of to island hop on our way up. And then again, that night the wind came down and we camped at this beautiful beach. Uh, things you can see again, always important to get things dry. Set up the bug house and had an absolutely uh, beautiful evening watching the sunset. A few bugs there, obviously, when you see us in bug jackets. We cooked most of the time over, our, over a fire. Uh, and then when it was too buggy or if it was too rainy, we did have our stoves as, as backup. Uh, this is a, a grill that uh, rolls up quite small. This looks like it was a, a meal of chili that was likely dehydrated and then hydrated at the spot so it would take up less room in the boats. So another beautiful sunset with uh, a campfire and uh, we made some bannock that night and another memorable beautiful evening. The next day had us paddling um, along that same handrail to our, our left using the land there to help us find our way through these different islands. When you're traveling on the ocean, you need to make sure you always know where your next water is coming from. So we knew this day that we always carried enough with us to get through one night, but we knew we would need to, to find a second stop. So we kept that in mind, looking for any kind of streams that might be coming in. Uh, stopped at another little cabin for lunch. I often say on an expedition, what do you see pictures of? You see pictures of food, you see pictures of beautiful scenery, and pictures of the boat, and then the occasional uh, pictures of wildlife. Uh, we actually didn't see as much uh, sign of wildlife on this particular trip as some. Uh, thankfully, we, we only saw a few bear tracks. We did see wolf track on occasion. Stopped uh, here, at, as I said, for lunch here, and then headed off knowing that we likely needed to find some water. So we stopped here to pick up some drinking water. Thought about camping here, but it wasn't um, super, uh, super nice. And we also sometimes don't want to actually camp near water. We want to just leave that so wildlife has access to it without having to, to go near humans. You'll see in the background there's some, you might not be able to tell, but it's an island. And so as we paddled along, we realized that this island could provide a lovely spot to camp. And so we landed and we walked up there. Our tents weren't there yet, of course, when we landed and we came around the corner and all of a sudden this little um, black circle popped its head up behind a rock. And I said, guys, there's a bear. And it's always kind of an exciting moment. You've got your bear spray on, but ideally you just like to um, not have an encounter. So we gathered up together and made ourselves big uh, and started just backing off and said, okay, not our island. And so got back in our boats and paddled around the corner. And there we saw the bear actually having made the same decision. Uh, it said it didn't want to have anything to do with us, which is wonderful when you see that in the bear's behavior when you're out. So it was actually swimming. Across there, you'll see the mainland again. So it was swimming from the island to the mainland. And so we said, well, I guess we actually can stay. So we came and, and made camp, uh, enjoyed uh, exploring our little island, practicing our jump shots. Uh, we did find our, our bear companion's uh, footprints there in a little muddy spot. And uh, so enjoyed our explorations, a little more jumping. It was a absolutely uh, stunning location. Saw this very interesting uh, red barked tree and thought, I wondered uh, how, how did it float to here? Because this would be a very unusual type of tree to, to see on our travels. And Mark decided to employ his bear early warning system. We often have used a tripwire system in the past that would you know go to an alarm so we would know a bear was coming in, especially important near the coast with the white bears. Um, so Mark had designed this wireless system, so they got it all set up. And if you can imagine, um, sometimes it's hard to 
know when you need to react and when it might be a false positive. So it turns out we might have to work on getting the system a little less sensitive because Mark had to jump out of his tent twice because of field mice running around and not bears. So uh, we'll be perfecting the system in the, in the future. So another little look at our, at our island camp, an absolutely stunning location. And again, the next morning, you're packing up camp, getting all the dust and dirt out of your tent. When we go outside, uh, sand and especially grid is really hard on zippers of um, tents. So it's important every day when you can, when the wind allows to, to empty that from your tents. And again, it's uh, the magic of these moments where you're treated to these views. And I think that's one of the main reasons I love to go out on, on expedition. And, and I'm a fan of mini and micro expeditions. So these days in these pandemic times, I've been taking micro and, and mini adventures near home. And then um, as conditions allow for safe travel, I will hopefully be planning my next big expedition, but just absolutely stunning views that morning, stunning paddling on a, a still ocean and we headed off. We called this an oily sea in sea kayaking. And we actually were able to stop here at this location and um, pick up some mussels for our lunch. So we we're reaching down, it was very shallow. You could reach down and pick up those mussels. So once we'd picked up lunch, we ended up on a beach with a pot of mussels and enjoyed cooking those up with a few supplements for, uh, for lunch before heading out. Um, I have a, a, a fun thing with Marion where we make shapes in the wilderness. So here the, the crew was making a shape as they were cutting wood. Super hot day, kind of interesting sometimes and, and a bit or very unnerving sometimes to be so far north and to be having these super hot days. So um, Darren being someone of pale complexion and red hair was feeling the heat quite dramatically. So he spotted this uh, leftover snow and had to go and get up close and personal with it. And had we not uh, had drinking water, we might have had to harvest some of that snow. So this is our, our final uh, wilderness camp of, of the trip here beside this freshwater um, lake, which would provide us our drinking water. Here we deployed the lily and it worked much better in this setting because we could get to both sides of the creek. Also deployed the satellite phone. When you get near the end of the trip, you might need to do more communications. We knew we were coming out to Hopedale, so we wanted to make sure everything was um, all charged up. So we got to listen to the loons call us uh, to sleep that night and uh, just uh, moved in. We were able to use a, a traditional uh, tent frame there. This would be a spot we would learn that folks from Hopedale might come out to either gather wood or to for traditional camp in wintertime. So that's why the, the tent frame was here. Treated to a beautiful sunrise the next morning again, that uh, pink sky. Being such a hot day, we wanted to actually seek out the wind. So we climbed up uh, above camp and to uh, get a good look at the ocean. So these are, you can see our tents there in the background, climbing high enjoying the view and we knew the ferry that we would be riding down south from Hopedale would be heading north so we we kept an eye out and it never came and we started to think oh I wonder what's on the go why isn't the ferry coming up and through so we made contact with our, with our home base with with Mark's wife and she said actually no you need to know that the ferry timing has been changed by eight hours so instead of uh, leaving at 5 p.m. on the day we thought it would, it was going to leave at 9 a.m. So we knew that we would need to uh, make sure that we got to Hopedale in plenty of time that uh, the next day. So we started to adjust our, our expectations and we actually could see Hopedale. So here we are looking from our high perch. We're looking down at Hopedale. It is still a, about a 15 K paddle from where we are because we had to go out around two headlands, but we are in what we call, you know, close enough that if we needed to, we could probably get there in almost any sea state. So as I said, we often see pictures of lunch. Uh, this was a very interesting geologic formation, uh, often called a dike, where uh, a different kind of rock goes into a cra uh, crack. Um, so this was uh, a different kind of rock than the granite beside it. Coming back down to camp, knowing that we uh, needed to um, 
start thinking about making our task list for when we hit Hopedale and we pass these beautiful irises and we just sort of had to stop and enjoy those. Coming around the corner, enjoying this uh, scene on the coast. And the next morning, uh, we were treated to a foggy departure. So you can see we had to come around those two um, headlands. And again, whenever you're coming around a headland, you're always pretty cognizant of what the wind and weather is doing, especially if you're paddling a canoe, a big boat like ours, so that it could be really affected by the wind. So we kind of tried to savor our last paddle strokes and um, enjoy our last time on this expedition. You can see we're quite bundled up um, because it is quite cold, probably about one degree in the fog and pretty exciting to see Hopedale and know that we'll be able to get there. Uh, we're starting to linger and pause and a little bit of celebration. This was our welcoming committee to Hopedale. So some folks had their, their sled dogs uh, out outside of town uh, for the summer season. And as we paddled in, uh, we could see the Hopedale Mission. This is a Canadian National Historic Site. And uh, Hopedale, it, Hopedale's original name was Avuktuk, uh, which was Place of the Whales. So a little closer look here at the Moravian Mission. Uh, there's, there were many missions. Uh, the Moravians came from Germany um, and came along the, the Labrador coast. So these um, mission buildings again um, have stood there a long time. They were often built first in Germany and then um, disassembled and brought across and then re-erected um, at sites in, in Labrador. This is the Nunatsavut Government Assembly Building and its, its architecture is meant to reflect the traditional igloo with also the shape of the mission building. And here we are stepping out near the, the ferry terminal. We wanted to be there fairly close because we knew we'd have to check in our, um, our paddling gear. And we were pretty glad that we'd got the, the, the heads up because with the shift of the ferry schedule, had we come in later in the day, we might have missed being able to drop our gear. So we could drop our gear at five the afternoon. So we went over first uh, to, the, to the mission and saw some historic photos. So this is the view from near the turn of the century. And then this is the view then now. Looking up at the, the cupola from the, the mission building, it reminded us of the previous year when we had been in Hebron and seen a similar architectural style. This is the ferry building with the, the map of the ferry and you can see that we were at the second stop there at Hopedale and then we would call in at Postville, Makovic, uh, Rigolet and then into uh, to Goose Bay. They were able to put our, give our, our gear its own container so we chose what we needed to have for the, the night and then could go off exploring um, Hopedale. So there you see the Canadian flag, the Nunatsavut flag and the uh, Newfoundland and Labrador flag. And here is the assembly building. Um, the, the rock to uh, around the, um, the window there is Labradorite. And if you've ever had the chance to see Labradorite, you know that it changes sort of iridescent blue and green in the sunlight. So absolutely uh, stunning, stunning uh, home for the Nunatsavut government. So we had one last night in our tents. We had actually hoped to stay in the Hopedale Hotel just to make packing easy, but they had no room. So we had a, another beautiful night out in our, our tents and then woke to a, a beautiful sunrise knowing that we were going to trade our very small boat for a very large boat. Um, this is the Comatic coming in and the Comatic will likely uh, change uh, life on the Labrador coast in that it is a passenger capable vehicle. So for the first time, it made bringing vehicles to and from Labrador much, um, much easier. So another look there at Hopedale, where we're starting our, our, our run. This boat is often called the coastal boat uh, because um, the coast does not, or these communities uh, on the Labrador coast, both uh, Inuit and Innu do not have um, roads to them. So the coastal boat is an important link for bringing in goods 
uh, during the short summer season. So this is us leaving the wharf in Hopedale, uh, being pretty uh, excited to be moving at 20 knots, not paddling ourselves, pretty comfortable. And it was interesting to get to come into all of the different communities along the way. So this is Postville. We didn't get to spend too much time in Postville, but it was a very busy wharf loading equipment and uh, vehicles on and off. Leaving Postville, we are making way for Makovic there at the, um, the turn around the headland of, um, we were able and were treated to some icebergs. Here in Makovic, I had actually been in a winter time, so interesting to, uh, to be back in summertime. This uh, young man put an impressive uh, display of snowmobile riding on the water uh, for us, and uh, a little sense of the different timing to go on the Komatik. Um, on the new uh, on the new boat so it took us about uh let's see i should i could do the math a uh, day and a half of of being on the ferry to come down from um, from hopedale to goose uh Makovic is a fishing community so uh, lots of fishing boats there then we left Makovic and started our way into um towards uh Rigolette. and the, the North Coast, they have this beautiful walking trail. Um, they do, there are a number of tourists that do ride the, the Labrador Ferry. So we, we indulged, headed out and enjoyed the walk while we uh, had the four hour times. And then as we headed into Lake Melville again, where we, uh, you saw so many days ago, uh, saw some folks enjoying the, again, still waters. Um, it took us two days to drive from Labrador. The, the Labrador Highway is getting more and more asphalt and is now um, not quite as long of a ride as it used to be when it was entirely gravel. Uh, then you take the ferry across um, the straits and the, the two ferries are actually sister ferries. So um, the Comatic and the, the Kayak, one goes across the straits, one does the Labrador coast. And then we ended up um, back home and it was time to clean up. So I'm going to unshare my screen now and um, escape from there. And um, I can take some questions. Yes, if anyone has any questions, you can just put them in the chat or the Q&A there um yeah oh yeah now i can now i can see the uh, <laughs> the, the chat and yes indeed labrador tea does make a beautiful uh, uh, a beautiful fabric dye all right so looks like we don't have any questions there actually oh i had a question myself mm -hmm. um do you have like, do you have an idea of the kind of the first place you want to go after COVID or an expedi expedition planned um, after, like once you can sort of go again? Mm -hmm. I don't yet have a, 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 a big plan. It sort of felt like it's, you kind of, we've kind of had to wait a bit. Um, we did a trip on the Labrador coast out of um, Saglick Bay, which is much further north than I was just showing you. And we were paddling to an island called Grimmington. And uh, it has these two most amazing peaks on it. And if you Google Bishop's Mitre, you'll see a couple of photographs. And we were able to get about halfway up it in the time we had. So I think there's a wish to go back to, to, to there. Um, I also have a long time wish to follow Mina Hubbard's um, expedition to go back up through the George River. It's changed a bit since there is the dam there now. So you can't quite go her exact route, but that was maybe on the docket for this summer. Um, so we'll be looking for companions for that. And of course, I, I'm also a big mountaineer. So maybe be looking for uh, another portion of the Great Himalayan Trail or maybe another climb in, in Nepal. Very cool. Awesome. Um, I think, oh, I was gonna say, but uh, I think it, the way that we learn how to go on big expeditions is to go on small expeditions, and the way we get comfortable in 
being out for long periods of time is by going out by short periods of time. And I remember I was heading out to climb uh, Denali, which is the highest peak in the US. And I was pretty nervous about going out for that length of time and that kind of cold conditions. And my um, friend said, you know what? You've done one winter overnight. You've done two overnights. If you can do an overnight, then you can do a 90 day trip. So um, I think if I was to give any kind of advice, it would be, it's perfect to start small, to practice mm -hmm. your skills, to get out there and experiment with your clothing systems, to experiment with what kind of outdoor activity you like, the kind of landscapes that speak to you, and um, grow your outdoor life from the tiny seed that it might be right now. And um, also, yes, to give back. Um, I know I spend a lot of time um, using the East Coast Trail for, for training, and now it's one of my life um, lifebloods in, in getting outdoors. And um, I do my best also to give back and to do service, to, to work on trail crew and to offer prizes for fundraising. We need to take very good care of the spaces that we travel through. And so I know that's one an important part of your program is, is the service as well as the learning of the outdoor skills. And so um, we need to take care of the places that we go out, travel as, as, with as little impact as we can and to learn how to do that well. So those would be a few parting pieces of, of, of some advice that I would offer to your participants. Awesome, thank you. Um, we had another question there. What is your favorite meal to eat on expedition? Um, usually one that's easy because I'm usually hungry. Um, <laughs> but when we did our McKinley or our McKinley, sorry, our, our Decho or um, trip on the Mackenzie, Athabasca and Slave Rivers, um, shepherd's pie because you could rehydrate all the components very quickly. It was tasty. It was very um, satisfying and had some uh, ground beef, mashed potatoes and corn or peas. We had two versions and uh, quick, delicious and full of yumminess. Yes, on my, my own CCC canoe trip, that was my favorite meal was our shepherd's pie. So <laughs> definitely see where you're coming from there. Um, all right, yeah, so it looks like that's all the questions. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it was awesome. I know it definitely made me want to get out and, <laughs> uh, and, and get outside for sure. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much and thank you everyone for, for coming. Um, yeah, thank yeah. you so much. That was really inspiring, especially yeah. these days. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for, for coming and, and yes, I wish you well with getting outdoors right now in micro ways and then um, in whatever makes sense after um, or through this, this whole process of COVID-19. Awesome. Thank you.